Hi, I'm going to explain consciousness using diverse scientific insights. Sometimes the word consciousness has meanings that relate to spirituality and feelings of self-worth. I'm not going to deal with that. Instead, I'm going to explain consciousness with a perspective that is biological. Through history, much time and effort has been devoted to speculating how the human brain generates consciousness. Thousands of books and papers have been written about it. They employ unfamiliar words like qualia and sentience, along with acronyms like AST and NCC. Two theories popular these days are Integrated Information Theory, IIT, and Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, GNW. Frankly, none of them make sense to me. I contend that discoveries by frontline researchers allow us to understand consciousness in ways that are relatively simple and matter of fact. In my book, How to Understand Everything, Consilience, A New Way to See the World, I devote only 14 short paragraphs to explaining how consciousness evolved. Therefore, you might expect that my account is simplistic. In this video, I'll explain the matter touching on various details and I hope to persuade you that my explanation is neither superficial nor a pie-in-the-sky theory. Instead, it is based on conclusions drawn as a result of advances in many disciplines, including chemistry, genetics, cell biology, paleontology, comparative anatomy, and computing. I employ the perspective of consilience, which is a way of thinking resulting from academic disciplines growing together, and it is bottom-up. To understand how the human brain works, we need to acknowledge the metaphors and presumptions hidden in scientific approaches. We have to step away from two presumptions. The first is that everything in the world can be unambiguously categorized and described using single words. The second is that systems are ruled over and can be explained using top-down theories and laws of the universe. These two presumptions have origins that are religious. By understanding the world from the standpoint of consilience, that is, from the bottom up, it allows us to see how the cells of the human body organize themselves and the neuronal mechanisms of consciousness. To use consilience as a mode of understanding, we need to establish a sharp distinction between the things that really exist in the world, like molecules, atoms, and elementary particles, and those that are conceptual, like information, words, and mathematics. This is an important distinction because everyone, including scientists, are prone to conflate things with ideas. It is easy to imagine that a concept like temperature actually exists, whereas from a purely scientific perspective, it is a concept that describes the behavior of particles, not a thing that really exists. In the same way, information is a concept that is emergent from the material properties of our neuronal systems. Information is a useful concept, but it does not actually exist. By making this distinction, we can understand the brain objectively and avoid conflating it with matters of spirituality and self-actualization. Let's start by describing and then dismantling traditional accounts about mankind's place in the animal kingdom and the development of human culture. The traditional picture is that life forms are arranged in a progression from low to higher, with humans near the top. The idea that humanity exists on a scala naturae can be traced back to Aristotle's biological and anatomical treatise written 2300 years ago. A prime mover was at the top of the ladder in an eternal domain, followed by angels, then man, then women, then warm-blooded quadrupeds, then birds and so on. When Charles Darwin conceived the theory of evolution, he was familiar with how farmers selected animals and seeds with the best traits. In the opening chapters of On the Origin of Species, he described how pigeons could be bred either to have exotic plumages or to be unremarkable, in which case they would be culled from the flock. The subtitle of Darwin's book, Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life, makes it clear that evolution is a process of natural selection. He thought nature did the selecting, much like a person would, 
only natural selection would be truer and bear the stamp of far higher workmanship. A consequence of this theory is that over time, human intelligence must increase. The process can be equated to how computers are being manufactured with increasingly fast clock speeds. This picture that our species is climbing a ladder of existence is supported by long-standing scientific viewpoints that the ingenuity of Homo sapiens evolved recently due to unique processes taking place in the cerebral cortex. No other species is as smart as us, therefore there must be special mechanisms at work in this large and wrinkly part of the human brain. This narrative biases our view of the brain's capabilities. Our brain enables us to build the devices that characterize civilization and therefore we presume we're able to understand natural systems using the same thought processes we use to make things. When we observe human anatomy, we can see that it is made of tissues and organs that form systems. We're comfortable defining the parts and comparing them to human built devices that we understand the heart because we can see that it works like a pump. The eyes are like video cameras and the brain is like a computer. This picture is seemingly scientific, but it gets in the way of us being able to understand how our brain is essentially similar to those of other animals and how brains are not organized by anything from the top down, nor from the outside. Let us look at how scientists working in cell biology have perspectives that are not aligned with top down metaphors. Instead, they think developmentally from the bottom up. The cellular mechanisms that operate in the intracellular medium that pull DNA apart and form gametes or split one cell into two are often overlooked because the structures are dynamic and almost invisible. These systems are extraordinarily sophisticated and reliable. This is hinted at by how long they took to evolve. They took 2.3 billion years to evolve from that point, the diversity of unicellular and multicellular life forms we observe today needed only 1.3 billion years to evolve. The mechanisms that turn genes on and off to create the tissues and structures in the adult body are self-organizing. Each of the over 20 trillion cells that make up our bodies organize themselves. To understand the systems that create consciousness, we need to acknowledge that neurons self-program. Now, let's take a look at the contributions of geneticists and paleobiologists. Geneticists now have powerful technologies that allow them to see which genes are shared between organisms. One discovery is termed deep homology. That is, once a gene evolves, it is used in subsequent generations without changing much. So for instance, the Hox genes that evolved hundreds of millions of years ago, responsible for the segmentation of worms and insects, still operate in the developing human fetus. Another example is Pax6, involved in the development of the eyes of many species, including insects, fish, and mammals. The picture described by paleobiologists is that a toolbox of basic anatomical features evolved long ago before the Cambrian period, that is before 540 million years ago. These features included bilateral symmetry, front-back differences, three cellular layers and differentiated segments. Then the items in the toolbox were reused and adapted for different functions. During the Cambrian, many types of animals arose with bizarre body forms, some of which became fossilized in rocks that were described in the late Stephen Jay Gould's book wonderful life, the Burgess shales, and the nature of history. The animals he documented were no longer just attached or burrowing on the ocean floor, but instead they swam in open water, able to use the increasing concentration of oxygen generated by newly evolved multicellular plants. This era was when nerve cells began to clump together into early brains, with some cells sensing and responding to light giving rise to the structures that give rise to consciousness. Before we take a look at the first steps in the evolution of consciousness, we need to look at the physiology of the human eye 
and recognize that it is not like a beautifully engineered video camera with a CCD array. Only one spot in the center of the visual field, known as the fovea, can register a high resolution image, and it is small, about the same size as looking down a large drinking straw. Outside this area, there are rod cells, able to register only shades of gray, large objects, or those that are moving. And the blind spot has no receptors at all. The beautiful high resolution image of the world that we experience is an illusion that is created in the brain. The eye provides hints of what is around us, and from that, the brain creates our sensation of dimensional reality. This experience of reality is, of course, not restricted to sight. It applies to the other senses as well. Everything that we experience at any moment is the result of accumulations of previous experiences that share similarities. Our senses provide just hints of the reality around us, and from that our brain creates a full-featured conscious experience. And so, when we glimpse an object, say a pencil, for just a fraction of a second, we instantly know what it looks like, what it would feel like if we touched it, and we can imagine what it would sound like if it fell on the floor. A quick glimpse recalls a multiplicity of sensations. If we wish, we can use our imagination to manipulate the pencil in ways that are unending. In other words, just a snippet of sensation is passed from the eye to the brain, which already has an expectation of what it sees, and then the brain creates the full-featured multisensory experience. There are other disciplines that are providing insights into the mechanisms at work in our sensory systems. Foremost are robotics and artificial intelligence. One finding is that it has proved almost impossible to create artificial visual systems using traditional programming approaches. That is, rules of logic cannot reliably differentiate between different objects under varying conditions. With machine learning, using large data sets on the other hand, systems can learn to differentiate between things with apparent intelligence. Machine learning is now routinely used by tech companies to recognize and tag images. On a broader front, mathematicians and computer engineers have shown that complex systems can emerge from simple repeated steps that are repeated. An example are these cellular automata patterns that are unendingly varied. We can now see that systems, in order to be useful, do not require a godlike programmer to design them by pre-planning them from the heavens. The complexity of living systems emerges from relatively simple, repeated steps that are self-organizing. I will now describe how consciousness got started. We need to go back to the early Cambrian period, around 540 million years ago, when worm-like animals began propelling themselves through the water, navigating towards food and away from predators. Let us visualize a proto-worm with simple taste sensors but no eyes. To survive, it needs to swim towards food. When it tastes food in the water, it wouldn't know the direction from which the taste is coming. However, using a process of trial and error, it could swim towards its source. If it swims and the taste diminishes, it would change direction. By doing this repeatedly, it would swim up the concentration gradient, getting closer and closer until it bumps into the food to eat it. The technical term for moving towards something in this way is known as taxis. The nervous system mechanism the worm needs to achieve taxis is quite simple. Plants exhibit taxis, they grow towards light, even microscopic bacteria can swim towards food, and the chemical pathways are simple enough that biochemists have figured out how they do it. But there's a problem with this method of finding food. Our protoworm never knows exactly which direction to go. When it swims using taxis, it might bump into the food, in which case it can eat it, but if it swims close by, it can only tell that it has been close when the taste starts diminishing. Then, when it changes direction, it might still go in the wrong direction. Now, 
imagine how much more successful it would be if instead of moving only toward or away from objects, it had a sense of where the objects were around it. This would be enabled by sensing the light absorbed by or reflected from objects. With several light sensors located behind a transparent lens, even without the need to move, it could sense where the objects are situated. Let's take a look at how this sensory apparatus can program itself. When it turns to the left, the object would appear to sweep from left to right. The beginnings of a brain would need to learn to direct the muscles to swim to the right. Through a process of trial and error, the components of the system could teach themselves how to swim towards particles of food. There's a shortcoming with this system. It would be impossible for the sensory apparatus to distinguish between changes in the light source due to its own movement and those resulting from something moving out there. This distinction is critical because something moving out there might be a predator that should be avoided, whereas sensations related to its own movement would be less of a threat. Very early in the evolution of mobile animals, the nervous system would have begun to distinguish between nerve impulses caused by me and those caused by out there. Sensations that are caused by me can generally be ignored, but those caused by things moving out there might indicate danger or opportunity. If the object triggering the stimuli is large, it might be a predator ready to eat it, or if it is small, it might be food. When considering the mechanisms, think about it from the perspective of the cells themselves. In human terms, me is not an imaginary knower consciously directing the process, but rather a cell responding to immediate feedback about the effects of internal versus external stimuli. By getting our head around this process, we can understand how consciousness came about. It evolved for a basic reason. In the minute-to-minute -minute struggle to eat and avoid being eaten, the capability to sense what is around an animal and move accordingly would have conferred an immediate survival advantage. This system was likely operational later in the Cambrian period, over 485 million years ago, when early fish were evolving. The development of greater visual acuity would allow more precise behavior. What started out as an array of light sensors eventually evolved into eyes with focusing lenses. Over long periods of time and with steady evolutionary pressure, this sensory device evolved into human eyes. So far, I have referred to sight and smell. The sense of touch would also contribute to the protoworm's sense of its surroundings. When animals began living out of the water, they developed the ability to pick up vibrations in the air and discern the direction they were coming from. These sounds were then married up with the sensations from the eyes and skin. The combination of sound, smell, touch and sight would provide the animal with a multifaceted experience of what is around it. Over time, each sensory realm would have become linked together. Comparative neuroanatomists estimate that full-scale integration of the senses happened over 300 million years ago when amphibians evolved from fish and ventured onto land. At that time, a region of the brain called the dorsal pallium started to develop. This part of the brain, located near the middle, is where all sensory inputs converge and become interlinked with nerves involved with movement. In recent evolutionary history, the dorsal pallium mushroomed in size. In humans, it became the two lobes of the cerebral cortex that handle the senses and thinking. The ability to move through a dimensional world and act appropriately is the reason for consciousness. The consciousness of less evolved animals is not close to human experience, but the differences lie along a continuum. Seen this way, consciousness is necessary for remote sensing. It is how animals, including humans, build up a picture of the world so we can move around purposefully. In my book, I describe how other parts of the neuronal system work, including how the neurons in the cerebral cortex function, and I use the metaphor of an orchestra. I also explain the ear, whose functioning is a little different to the accounts you find in high school textbooks, and I describe how speaking and writing 
are physical activities little different from eating and making things. At no point is it necessary to appeal to hard-to-grasp theories of everything, singularities, quantum entanglement, or esoteric postulations. In fact, I shun theories and explain as straightforwardly as possible what frontline researchers have been revealing. By understanding consciousness, we can face up to the realities of the biology of our brains and bring into focus a down-to-earth picture of human capabilities and vulnerabilities. Consilience allows us to understand ourselves scientifically and at the same time open our minds to diverse perspectives.